Hello, and welcome to Adapter Parish, episode 37, True Grit. Before we hit the trail, let's talk about our next episode. We thought we'd keep the Western theme going, but choose something that deals with themes that are maybe more interesting to us here at Adapter Parish. So in two weeks, on Tuesday, March 12th, we will be discussing Brokeback Mountain. We read Annie Peru's original short story, and we watched the 2005 movie directed by Ang Lee and starring Heath Ledger and Jake Gyllenhaal. Yeah, it's going to be a real funny one. Just lots of lots of jokes. I I, I, lots of jokes over here. I tell you what, it's uh, it's in two weeks. If you have any comments, questions, or corrections that you'd like to hear on the show, remember to email adapterparishcast at gmail.com or tweet at us using the adaptcast hashtag. You can find all of the show notes from this and other episodes at adapterparishcast.com. And with that, on with the show. True Grit by Charles Portis. Hello and welcome to Adapter Parish. My name is Jeremy Latour. And I'm Arielle Lipshaw. This is the podcast about adaptation. Where today we are talking about an adaptation. I So, okay. We've talked about this a bunch very recently. Yeah. Is this another, like, dad episode? Um, maybe. Because we did The Hunt for Red October. Yeah. But we did that because, like, okay, we did it. We did it for you. We didn't do it because it's, like, a dad thing. Yeah. But this one, neither of us had ever read or seen well, no, I guess I saw the new movie. Yeah. But like, is this a dad show I, now? I, I, maybe. Maybe. Is this is this dad core? I guess so. <laughs> That's the thing. We were looking for we were looking for a book that had true grit. Yes. We were looking for a book that had been adapted multiple times and maybe was not so very long. Yeah. And we found true grit. <laughs> Uh, what, what's your, what's your history with this? You said you saw the movie, the second movie when it came out. I went to go see the 2010 movie in theaters, uh, because like it looked good and Jeff Bridges was in it. I think I saw like 15 minutes of it one time. Yeah. And that's sort of my history. But like, I knew that it was something that I thought that I would like. And I think I had heard that the book was good. Sometimes the segment is longer. (laughs) Some, some of you have asked, what does it sound like when... (laughs) You choose a property that neither of you know very well, and this is what it sounds like. This segment sounds very short. Yep. But no, but going back to the movie, like, I enjoyed it. Yeah. I definitely enjoyed it and was always interested in reading the book. Yeah. And I remember, like, when the movie came out, there was all this talk about how... Because I'd never seen the John Wayne version. Right. But there was all this talk about how the Coen brothers, Joel and Ethan, they tried to base it off the book Mm -hmm. and not off of the John Wayne movie. Right. And I remember thinking, oh, that's interesting. I wonder I wonder how that plays out. Now I know, they, but I didn't for a very long time. Yeah, so we'll get into how well we thought they did in a minute. But do you want to, should we just start? Should we just jump right into this and talk about this here book? Yeah. Okay. I, I think you should talk about this here book. Okay, I'm going to do, reckon. this is True Grit by Charles Portis, and I'm going to do back of the book. Go for it. Charles Portis has long been acclaimed as one of America's foremost writers. Not true. No one's heard of him. True Grit... Which is kind of his thing. Yeah. True Grit, his most famous novel, not a lot to choose from. Okay, I won't do the commentary. I usually don't do commentary in the back of the book until I'm done. Yeah. First published in 1968 and became the basis for two movies, the 1969 classic starring John Wayne, and in 2010, a new version starring Academy Award winner Jeff Bridges and written and directed by the Coen brothers. This, by the way, this paperback is the movie tie-in This is the movie tie-in. True Grit tells the story of Maddie Ross, who was just 14 when the coward Tom Chaney shoots her father down in Fort Smith, Arkansas, and robs him of his life, his horse, and $150 in cash. Maddie leaves home to avenge her father's blood. With one-eyed Rooster Cogburn, the meanest available U.S. Marshal, by her side, Maddie pursues the killer into Indian territory. True Grit is eccentric, cool, straight, and unflinching like Maddie herself. From a writer of true status, this is an American classic through and through. It's not bad. Yeah. I mean, that's a description of this novel. It's not very long. Can I see it for a second? Yeah, sure. There's a quote on the back that I really love. Charles Portis could be Cormac McCarthy if he wanted to, but he'd rather be funny. Yeah, that's a good one. I, that jumped out at me because yeah. this book is super funny. Yeah, it's really funny. I enjoy, Okay, so like, let's get out of the way. I enjoyed the shit out of this book. This is the first book we've done for the podcast. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think I am. Um, this is the first one we've done that had a male writer writing in the first person as a female character. Untrue. Oh, yeah? The Fault in Our Stars. 
That's fair. Yeah, no, that's super fair. Well, the interesting thing is that in that case is that both of these are about teenage both of them are teenage girls. Yeah. The interesting thing to me about her being a teenage girl is the fact that she's a girl is important and plays into the plot about like why they don't want to take her with them on this on this journey and that people don't take her seriously. But she doesn't spend a lot of time thinking about herself as a girl, which I think is very cool. Um, if you're familiar with the subreddit Men Writing Women, um, there is a tendency of male authors to think that women think about their boobs a lot. That is not the case. That's not true? No. It's just part of your body. I have to, I have to re-examine some things. Ha- okay. I have to re-examine my assumptions. Great. But... I don't think there's anything in here that I was like, a 14-year-old girl would never think that. And I was a 14-year-old girl. And I was a pretty, like, pragmatic and unusual 14-year-old girl, much like Maddie Ross. Like, I identified with this character. Maybe, like, that's a little bit of self-inflation to say I identified with this character because she's great. But I did. So I guess this is now me saying the female character is not underwritten and we don't really need to come back to it because I thought this was a great example of... A man writing a female character in such a way that the fact that she is a girl is important, but he's not seeing her through the lens of girl. He's seeing her through the lens of Maddie Ross, this very interesting character that I've created. Mm-hmm. I, I want to dig in for a second because you you say she's great. Yes. What do you like? Because I love Maddie Ross. Yeah. I think she's a fantastic character. What do you like about her? Um, She is super practical. She is really good at making a plan and she sees through bullshit really fast. Mm -hmm. Um, And she is always the adult in any room that she is in. I agree with all of that. Yeah. I think that's the, the, one of the things that the book does really, really well is that uh, Charles Portis has this, he has a handle on character Mm -hmm. that a lot of people don't uh, because if we actually break this book down into plot, yeah, not a lot happens. No, the, the book you could really look at it as like, well, there's five occurrences, mm-hmm. and our characters just move from one to the other. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a sort of a classic journey, like yeah. the Wizard of Oz or anything where characters like it's it's. Episo- it's an episodic journey in the way that Alice in Wonderland or The Wizard of Oz, like those really classic stories of someone in a journey in a strange world, but you learn a lot about the characters throughout. Yeah, because if, if this was, if it was written by someone who didn't have such a good handle on character, yeah. it'd be a nothing book. Yeah. Like, I don't think anyone would talk about it. It would probably be someone's favorite book and get adapted because the actual central storyline, pretty, it's pretty compelling. Yeah. You know, her dad gets killed and she wants to find the guy that did it. Yeah. But that's not the thing that makes the book so compelling and that makes the movies so compelling. Yeah. I mean, the th- one of the things that makes it very compelling is it's very funny. Yeah. Like, it's... It's dealing with serious topics and the people who are dealing with those serious topics take them pretty seriously. And the place the humor comes in is these sort of deep character studies of people who are ridiculous, for example. And we're going to talk about the plot in just a second. But the scene that she has with the the, the um, horse selling guy, like that could have been just a nothing, very practical scene of her getting it sort of getting an errand accomplished but the fact that that character that she's interacting with is so ridiculous makes it amazing and he's very sympathetic like we're pretty much sympathetic to everybody almost up to and including um no everyone including including tom cheney including tom the man cheney. who killed her father i mean the moment tom cheney says everyone is against me and now i'm shot by a child uh you just love tom cheney I've, yeah, I kind of feel bad for everybody. Yeah. There's like literally, no, you know the only character that I really don't feel bad for? Uh, who's that? LaBeef. Oh, yeah, LaBeef's a piece of shit. Do you want to like go through the plot? Let's talk about the plot. Okay. okay. I'm going to try and you can stop me if you feel like I'm taking too long. I will if I do. Okay. Maddie Ross is a 14-year-old girl who lives in Yale County, Arkansas with her mother and father. Her father goes to Fort Smith to buy some horses. And takes along their hired man, Tom Chaney. While there, Tom Chaney gets drunk, gets into a fight, and shoots and kills her father and robs him and rides off. This all happens before the book begins. But this is important backstory. Maddie travels by train to Fort Smith to arrange her father's affairs. And while there, she realizes that she doesn't really trust any of the officers of the law in the town to take uh, decisive action in 
uh, tracking down Tom Chaney, and she decides that she needs to take control of the situation. That's actually something I love that when she gets there, she's working on the, the assumption that the law is going after him. Yes. Like, she assumes, I'm going to get there. I'm going to get my father's body. The law will be after Tom Chaney, and they will get Tom Chaney. And the book happens because when she gets there, they say, yeah, there's not a lot we can do. He's in Indian territory, and we don't have jurisdiction. Yeah. You have to get a U.S. Marshal. Well, when are they going after him? Well, they're pretty busy, so <laughs> I don't know. She asks, I believe, the sheriff or someone in the town, who's the best U.S. Marshal? And he said, he names off a couple, and he says, well, this guy... Uh, is the nicest and this guy's the meanest but this guy's the best he's the most fair he has the best sense of justice and she says oh the the meanest one yeah I want him like this is this goes back to the characterization I was talking about yeah, yeah. you introduce a character by showing actions and choices mm -hmm. that's how you find out what's happening inside of a character you don't find out by them saying this is what's happening inside my head you find it out through their choices right. and I love the fact that this is like one of the first choices that we as an audience see her make. Yeah. We know what's going on inside her head because she heard the meanest. She heard one line about him and was like, okay, that's the guy yeah, I Yeah, like want. her line, you don't see her say like, well, I thought about it and this was my thought process and this was my decision. Literally, it's just, where can I find this rooster? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I said. And rooster she, Cogburn. So I just want to introduce two more characters and then we can kind of move off of the straight plot summary. We can mosey on. Yeah, we can mosey, mosey on down the can road. Can start hitting the old dusty trail. Oh boy. Okay. Um, the tumbleweeds are coming. <laughs> it's a stampede. She encounters Rooster giving testimony. Westerns uh, are not my favorite. I, I can see that. But this was very delightful. I loved it. We encounter Rooster in the courthouse giving testimony about how he killed like three men in the um, course of his duty as a U.S. Marshal tracking these guys down. I, I almost don't want to spoil yeah, this scene. It's very good. I, I have a really big thing about character introductions. Yeah. It's like one of my favorite things and it's one of the things that pisses me off the most when it's mishandled mm -hmm. when it's done well it's amazing and when it's done poorly i think it just kind of ruins things yeah that's that i'm realizing that's a huge overstatement and i don't have a lot of stuff to back it up but i'm gonna stick with it that's fine rooster's introduction in this story is incredible yeah Yes, because we meet him literally giving testimony and the way that we're learning stuff about him is how he's being cross-examined. Like, we're sort of learning this along. But, I mean, the thing that makes it interesting is we're learning along with Maddie, mm -hmm. the kind of person that he is. So at first it sounds like he is just a normal, everyday U.S. Marshal. And then as he continues to be cross-examined on the stand, we start to think, it is possible he just had a vendetta against these guys and sh tracked them down and killed them out of vengeance. That that may be what happened. We're not sure. We're never told. And then she gets to, and but she sees that too and gets to make the choice again. No, I wanted him before. Yeah. Now I really want him because he has grit. Yeah. True grit. True grit. Which does come up. Um, one other character. Mm -hmm. Would you like to talk about Labeef? She meets Shia LaBeouf. She does not. She meets uh, Texas Ranger Labeef. Mm hmm who is just a fucking creep and kind of a, like, a dandy? Yeah. He he certainly has a high opinion of himself. Definitely. Probably the highest opinion of anybody in this story. <laughs> uh, he So basically what we find out is that Tom Chaney was actually going by another name in Texas. Yes. And killed a senator and the senator's dog. And oh, Le no. LaBeef has been coming after him. So basically our three characters come together yes. because... Maddie wants Cheney. Yes. She wants Rooster to get him. She's going to pay Rooster to do it. So he's on board. Yes. And Labeef wants to be cut in because he wants Cheney as well. And there's a really big reward in Texas for it. Yes. And she wants him to be hanged in Fort Smith for killing her father. And they keep, sort of keep saying to her, why does it matter where he's executed? And she's like, well, it does. It does matter. Oh, there's a hanging at the beginning of this that we should talk about. Basically, so she comes to Fort Smith with her family's hired man, Yarnell, the good hired man, not the bad hired man, Tom Chaney, but the good hired man that's been with them forever. It turns out that the town is full, basically, because there's a hanging and she wants to go see the hanging and Yarnell says, your mom would not like it if I let you go see that hanging. But he wants to go. So she's like, no, no, we'll we'll go. We just won't tell. We won't tell mama. And I feel like the scene with the hanging, because this is basically the first thing that happens in the book. Like, it happens before she even starts going around inquiring, like, after her dad's stuff. Like, the first thing they do is they go see the hanging. And it just sets the tone for the book, which is that this is something very serious that's happening. Three men are being hanged in the middle of the town. And it's the fucking funniest scene 
you've ever heard. It is so funny. All it, three guys being hanged are like immaculately characterized. Like in such a short time, all three of them, you kind of know everything about all of them. And you're seeing it all through Maddie's eyes. And she's very impressed by the whole thing. Like she really wants this to be Tom Chaney. She wants Tom Chaney up there on the gallows telling every the entire town that he's very sorry for what he did. That's what she wants. Go ahead. So now that we've met all our characters, yeah. I think the thing that's really nice is basically from here on out, there's only like four or five things that happen. Yeah. And the book is all the stuff that happens between those events. So here's event number one. They leave town. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that happens where Labeef and Rooster go in together and they're going to try to leave her behind and she manages to manages to ingratiate herself with them. Yeah. In the meantime, she's bought a horse. L- oh, Lil Blackie is an important character. Yeah. Well, oh, R.I.P. R- pour one out for Lil Blackie. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Lil Blackie's story is kind of sad. I Of the two movies we saw, I only watched the scene where Lil Blackie beefs it one time. Yeah. The other time I covered my face. Actually, I think we fast forwarded it. It's very sad. It's very sad. So that's like one event. Yeah. And then the second event is they come upon this like little shack. Yeah. It's a dugout. Yeah. And like stuff happens and we meet other characters and there's a thing that happens where they meet these two, what we come to learn are outlaws. Yeah. And these two idiots essentially. Yeah. Uh, Rooster and Labeef have learned that Tom Chaney is running with the Lucky Ned Pepper gang. Yes. <laughs> and Rooster knows him. Like, he knows this he guy. He knows Lucky Ned. He knows him very well because he shot Lucky Ned in the face. <laughs> um, so Lucky Ned doesn't like uh, Rooster very much. Because he shot much. him in the face. Yeah. So uh, they meet some ne'er-do-wells and the ne'er-do-wells beef it and... Well, yeah. We'll get into the it, details of it later. It, like, or we or not. Well... It's a good scene in both movies. It's a, I mean, it's a good scene, but we don't have to describe every single scene. Let's keep going. Okay. Then they basically stake out the dugout yeah. when the Lucky Ned Pepper Gang shows well, up. Because they learn, this is the important thing. They learn from the outlaws that the Lucky Ned Pepper Gang is going to rob the train mm-hmm. and then come to this dugout to switch horses. That's the information they get from these two guys before they both beef it. Yeah. So then... <laughs> There's a big shootout because the Lucky Ned Pepper gang shows up. Yeah. And there's a whole bunch of shooting and a couple it's, of his guys die. Yeah, Labeef fucks up essentially. Labeef definitely fucks up. Yeah. And where we are left with at this point is Ned Pepper has gotten away. Yes. They did not see Tom Chaney. Yes. They do not know if he is with them. But they did kill a bunch of Lucky Ned Pepper's guys. Yes. Then they're back on the road and we get to see more stuff of them hanging out. Yeah. Then... Third event happens. Maddie happens upon Tom Chaney. She does. Just happens upon him. And this is maybe the funniest scene in the whole book. Because it has... so It has my favorite line. She shoots him. He doesn't think she can do it. Wait, I love, can I read it out? Sure. But I just like to set it up. I love the dynamic between her and Tom Chaney because she hates him. She sees him as this criminal who murdered her father like a mastermind yeah. he no what are you talking about she she thinks he's very clever no she doesn't yes she does no there's that whole scene where someone says he labeef oh you're right i'm sorry i meant no I mixed, I there's, it up. there's the great scene when she's talking to labeef and labeef said i've been on cheney for a long time he's and she says well why haven't you got him and he says well he's he's real smart she says huh he didn't strike me as being yeah, smart when right. I knew him. That's right. I had them switch. I'm also like ruining the dialogue. We haven't talked about the dialogue yet, but yeah. it's great. Well, when I read this out, maybe it'll be a good starting point for that. Sure. All right. Keep going. So she happens upon him. She thinks he's this awful, terrible criminal who killed her father. He is so amused by her. She is facing off with him and he's just like, oh shit, it's this Maddie Ross. How are you doing? And she takes out her gun to point it at him, and he goes, "Oh, so you're gonna shoot me? I guess. Well, you know, if you wanna, if you wanna shoot me, you're probably gonna wanna cock the gun." And so she cocks it part way, and he says, "No, no, all the way back." And she goes all the way back, and he's just delighted by this until she actually shoots him. <laughs> and do you want to do the reading? Yeah. All right. So for the purposes of this dramatic reading, we don't always do these, but when we do, you know, we do it right. Um, I shall portray Maddie Ross, who is also the narrator, and Jeremy will portray the coward Tom Chaney. And reading the prose, we have Jeff Bridges. We do not. (laughs) That would be great. I said, if you refuse to go, I will have to shoot you. He went on with his work and said, oh, then you'd better cock your piece. I had forgotten about that. I pulled the hammer back with both thumbs. All the way back till it locks, said Chaney. I know how to do it, 
said I. When it was ready, I said, you will not go with me? I think not, said he. It is just the other way around. You are going with me. I pointed the revolver at his belly and shot him down. (laughs) The explosion kicked me backwards and caused me to lose my footing, and the pistol jumped from my hand. I lost no time in recovering it and getting to my feet. The ball had struck Cheney's side and knocked him into a sitting position against a tree. I heard Rooster or Labeef call out for me. I am down here, I replied. There was another shout from the hill above Cheney. He was holding both hands down on his side. He said, I did not think that you would do it. I said, what do you think now? He said, one of my short ribs is broken. It hurts every breath I take. I said, you killed my father when he was trying to help you. I have one of the gold pieces you took from him. Now give me the other. I regret that shooting, said he. Mr. Ross was decent to me, but he ought not to have meddled in my business. I was drinking and I was mad through and through. Nothing has gone right for me. There was more yelling from the hills. I said, no, you are just a piece of trash. That is all. They say you shot a senator in the state of Texas. That man threatened my life. I was justified. Everything is against me. Now I am shot by a child. Tom Chaney's great. Everyone in this book is great. I love it. I feel for everybody. Yeah. Like, Tom Chaney's a piece of shit and he should die yeah. for what he did. Yeah. You know, in the context of the story. Yeah. But he's a delight. Yeah. And Lucky Ned Pepper is kind of a delight. Yeah. Like, he he is, he is gets really into Maddie. Like, he thinks she's great. He's like, most girls like pretty things. You like guns. She's like, I don't like guns. If I liked guns, I wouldn't be carrying around this thing that doesn't work. Like I would have an actual gun that works. What do you think? I think he's definitely entertained by her. Yeah. Like it's definitely, it's not one of these fun kind of things where, no, he really likes her. Like, no, no, like he's a shitty, horrible person he'll kill and her a criminal. He, he'll kill her if he has to. Yeah. But, but he kind of hopes he doesn't have to. Yeah. Yeah. So then we have kind of the final scene Yeah. where uh, Ned Pepper happens upon them and he takes Maddie hostage and he holds her hostage and he makes Rooster and Labeef go away and they go away, but they pretend to go away. And he takes her back up to their camp where him and the rest of the lucky Ned Pepper gang is and Cheney's there after being shot. He's fine. And there's like a big shootout and Rooster has his big heroic like sprint against the gang across yeah. a meadow. It's like the scene. Yeah. Yeah. It like in the, especially in the John Wayne version, yeah. it's like the scene. And then Labeef, shoot does like a sharp shooting thing and shoots lucky ned right off his horse yeah like right before he's about to kill rooster yeah. after rooster's killed everybody else yeah and then a couple of things happen really quickly uh first of all uh so labeef has made his way up to the camp tom cheney hits labeef with a rock yes and knocks him out yes then he goes after maddie rooster's not back up yet so maddie shoots him with the gun again this time kills him yeah but in doing so falls down this pit it's a ki- it's a huge gun and it's got yeah. a huge kickback and she's tiny falls down into a pit full of snakes and is down in the pit until rooster comes back and he and labeef help her up out of the pit not before she's been bitten by a snake right and then yeah okay and then basically rooster takes her back to town they leave labeef yeah and they take her back to town but then Lil Blackie dies because oh, he gets exhausted because Rooster's running him like crazy because he wants to save this girl that he like suddenly cares about. Yeah. Not suddenly cares about, but like has grown, has to, grown care to care about. Has grown to care about. I mean, this is like one of the classic plots, you know, like the older man entrusted with this girl that he didn't want and comes to find that he has fatherly feelings for her. This is the plot of the video game The Last of Us. And yeah. also children of men. <laughs> right. Yeah. And also she's lost her father. So now she has kind of a new father. Yeah. Long story short, she makes it back. She lives. They have to cut her arm off. Yeah. And then the book has this nice little epilogue where it's like 25 years later and she goes to find Rooster again and he has died. Yeah. He has beefed it. And <laughs> Labeef is somewhere she doesn't know where. And that's kind of the end of the book. Yeah. But we see her as an adult, like very much the same person. But the actual like mechanics of the plot, like the plot just moves along. It just, ha- this thing happens at least to this thing and this thing and then it's done. Yeah. I mean, it's not a very long, hang on. It's like a, a little over 200 pages, like 225 pages. It's not a very long book. It's mm-hmm. a good read. I so, definitely recommend it. Well, do you know how it was originally published? Mm-mm. It was published in a serialized format. Oh, that's cool. In the Saturday Evening Post. Yeah. In 1968. Cool. So, which makes a lot of sense. I feel like we're we ha- we're not like in that era. I feel like that's like such an old timey thing to do. Like, oh, the novel was published serialized in the Saturday Evening Post. I guess so. No, do you know what I think it is though? What's that? Like, I think TV is the new serialized fiction. I guess, yeah. Because I think TV back then was a little more like there weren't stories that went from episode yeah, to episode. Yeah, it was 
was much more episodic. Right. Yeah. Now, though, I think TV shows have kind of replaced that serialized entertainment. That makes sense. I buy it. But that's the book. Yeah. True Grit. Yeah. I don't like I don't want to I don't feel bad ruining the plot for people because the strength of this book is not the plot it's the characters sure. and their interactions with each other yeah okay so that's the plot of the book there are a couple of things first of all we never actually talked about Charles Portis which I know you did a bunch of research on so we should do that I, well a bunch is an overstatement okay you did some research on I sure did um but like I think the other thing especially um as regards adaptation that's important is the use of language in this book and we heard a little bit of it in that reading that's why i kind of wanted to do a longer reading so you could kind of hear the rhythm and the way that the people talk um but what did you think about the way like it's 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 unusual like what did you think about the, the way that language and dialogue was used in this book it's incredible um it kind of i felt myself a bit confounded yes when i was reading this book because as I was reading it, I was definitely reading it in terms of knowing we were going to watch adaptations of it. Mm -hmm. But I read it before we watched uh, like the John Wayne version. Sure. And I'm trying to hear in my head John Wayne say these lines. And I couldn't make it work in my head. Mm -hmm. And I, I have to own that this is just a limitation of mine. I don't think I delivered those lines very well ah, when I was did, reading. You did fine. I did. Okay. You that's did that's fine. fine. But the thing about the lines that really gets me, it's such a simple thing, but there are no contractions like almost ever. Yeah, almost ever. Everyone speaks every single word that they are going to say. Yes. I they, will. They do that thing. Yeah. I will not instead of I won't. Yeah. Stuff like that. And I, I just struggle making that sound okay in my head. You know, just to spoil one thing, we'll talk about it more, but like in the 1969 version, they kind of take that out. Yeah, I mean, I think they do a little bit of it, but it's not like if you haven't read the book, it wouldn't be noticeable, I don't think. Mm -hmm. Whereas, again, to spoil a tiny bit, the 2010 version, there's a very particular rhythm to the dialogue that if you have read the book, you recognize, I think. Yeah, they, yeah. they kept, I'm not going to say they kept every single line, yeah. but they kept the style like 100%. Yeah. It is It is in the 2010 yeah, version. Yeah, which knowing the Coen brothers and the way they work in terms of scripts does not surprise me no. at all. They're extremely deliberate, like down to the syllable about what words they want to have on screen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I think, I think it's nice to kind of end talking about the book on the dialogue mm -hmm. because it is one of the strengths of the book. Yeah, and this will come up again when we talk about the two movies. So Charles Portis. Yeah, let's let's talk about this because I don't know any of the things that you're about to say. You assumed at the beginning that no one knows who he is. I assumed that, yeah. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I know. That was the thing I kind of found out from this. I had never heard of him. He is... He's... <laughs> He's one of these people, like, he's only published, like, five or six novels. Mm -hmm. He started his life as a journalist and basically quit journalism after a few years to just write books. Mm -hmm. And the people who know him fucking love him. Yeah. Like, he just seems like a really cool, decent, humble guy. Is he still with us? Yeah. That's great. Okay, so this was something. When did you, before we started all of this, when did you think this book was written? Oh, I knew it was written in the 60s. Like, I knew it was written the year before. Like, it the turnaround between when this book came out and the John Wayne movie was like a year. You knew more than I did. Oh, okay. I always assumed this book was written decades before that. I see. I thought this was like, I wasn't going to say it was like contemporaneous with when it when it takes place, but I thought it was an old book no i mean my impression of this and you can you know more about charles portis and like the genre or oeuvre he was writing in than i do but my impression of this was it's very much along the almost satirical lines of like catch 22 like in that sort of 60s mentality of like kind of um satirizing things that are really um ingrained into the american culture that yeah. was my feeling of it. No, you're right. Yeah. No, now and I know that now. Yeah, yeah, no. I just that yeah. was that was my impression. I didn't know it then. Oh, okay. But yeah, he basically only wrote like five or six books over the course of twenty something years. He is beloved. This book was a hit. It was a really big hit. And then like Im as you say, immediately became a hit movie. Yeah. And it seemed like on the, the, the DVD for the 2010 version, there's a fantastic like half hour documentary all about Charles Portis mm -hmm. that I would recommend that anyone who's interested watches. Because it gives you a really interesting perspective on him where there are definitely people who didn't want to take the book seriously as a piece of literature because it was so popular. Yeah. And there's a whole bunch of people that have a huge chip on their shoulder about that. Yeah. Who are just like, yeah, the the intellectual elites don't think that it's great because of this. Like, I hate both of those people. <laughs> yeah. It's like, okay, whatever. Like, let's all agree it's a really, really good book. And then maybe we can kind of move on from there. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's a great book. There's like nothing else to say about him because of how 
reclusive he is. Mm -hmm. But he's still alive. He just, yeah. That's great. He's like 85. Good for him. He wants his books to just speak for themselves. Mm -hmm. He got, in like 2010, he received some like Lifetime Achievement Award. And he got up and gave his speech. And the speech lasted less than a minute. And it was basically like, I'm not sure I deserve this. Thank you very much. And left. Good. Good job, Charles Portis. So, in 1969, this was a movie. I have here the DVD. Do you want to read the back of the box? Sure. It's got John Wayne on the cover with an eye patch. Oh, John Wayne's in this movie? Uh, yeah, sorry. Oh, I Did no I spoil idea. something? I had no idea. John Wayne. <laughs> oh, jeez. It's all in caps. John Wayne earned the 1969 Best Actor Academy Award for this larger-than-life performance as the drunken, uncouth, and totally fearless one-eyed U.S. Marshal Rooster Cogburn. Yeah, he's got one eye. I guess we never mentioned oh, that. Oh, yeah, he's got an eye patch. The cantankerous rooster is hired by a headstrong young girl to find the man who murdered her father and fled with the family savings. Which, what? He didn't flee I with... I guess so. That's not true. When Cogburn's employer insists on accompanying the old gunfighter, sparks fly. And the situation goes from trouble to disastrous when an inexperienced Texas Ranger joins the party. Laughter and tears punctuate the wild action in this extraordinary Western, which also features performances by Robert Duvall, Jeremy Slate, and Struther Martin. I hate this for several reasons. What do you hate this for? First of all, Rooster Cogburn is not the main character of this book or movie. He's... No, he's not. But he's John Wayne. I don't care. And John Wayne is the main character of everything that stars John Wayne. He is... Okay. That's... I mean, that's okay. But literally never even says maddie ross's name no nope. it just says a young girl mm-hmm. and she's not mentioned in any of the thing any of the na- oh i guess her employer his employer i'm sorry you didn't read out the names so it does say the name of the actress oh kim i'm darby. sorry i left out some of the actors i apologize well, for that. I, kim I was, darby is mentioned i was getting mad that she was overlooked okay so that's fine but i just love like okay so when i was a kid i did plays right like i was in a lot of plays but i was never the lead but I really took to heart what my instructors and directors always said, which is, of course, there's no small parts, only small actors. So what I would always do is rewrite like the summary of the play as if I were the main character. And I would. Of fig- course you did. And I would figure out all of the reasons why the plot of the play couldn't happen without me, the main character, which is hard when you're like townsperson number three. <laughs> but i would do it in some way yep so that's what this reminds me of it reminds me of someone who's not the main character rewriting the summary as if they were the main character um because it's not rooster cogburn is hired by a headstrong young girl it's a headstrong young girl hires rooster cogburn yeah (laughs) she is the actor he is the subject so that pisses me off Mm mm-hmm I do like the headline, which you also didn't read, which is three unlikely companions, one shot at justice. Oh, sorry. But the other thing about the way this is written, this is my only other thing, is that it's written to make the other two people both sound like idiots, like headstrong young girl, an inexperienced Texas Ranger. He's not inexperienced. He's a very good Texas Ranger. The whole... The, he the, happens to be his ba- his own biggest fan. Yeah, like the comedy comes from the sort of the cultural differences between this sort of dandified Texas Ranger and this like hardened older U.S. Marshal. But it doesn't mean he's not good at his job. The the scene where they where they're like all kind of telling campfire stories about like their hardships on the road, and he talks about drinking like lapping water. He's like, I lapped water from a horse's hoof more than once, and I was glad to get Hoofprint. it. Hoof print. Yes, not the hoof. The hoof print. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the tumbleweeds. My God, the tumbleweeds. <laughs> and, I reckon. And Rooster's like, if I ever met one of you Texas Rangers that had never lapped water from a horse's hoof print, I would shake him by the hand and buy him a beer. And um, Labeef is like, what? You don't believe me? And Cogbert's like, I believed it the first 25 times I heard it. <laughs> like, they just have this contentious relationship kind of based on their experiences on the trail but it doesn't mean he's inexperienced or bad at his job well i think this is the problem where okay i want to describe this book in like a sentence or two okay and you tell me if you think i'm i'm right okay if you think if you feel like it's accurate this is the story of an exceptional young woman yes who goes on an adventure with a series of adults and forms relationships with them. Sure. Okay? Yeah. Very. I know that's super reductive. Yeah, it's but like, reductive, but it's fine. But I think that's accurate. Okay. The problem is, if you're going to take that story and, like, force it into the, like, 
modern American mythology of John Wayne, right. <laughs> it's not going to come out the other side the same way. Yeah. Like, as soon as John Wayne is involved, the story is no longer about anyone that isn't John Wayne. Yeah. I'm not saying that's a good thing. Yeah. No, like, I get it. And but, I'm also... But it, is, but it is the reality of the situation. I also want to be clear that I enjoyed watching this movie. Oh, totally. Yeah. It's super fun. And yeah. John Wayne's great in it. He's great. And he won his, his only Oscar for this. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So... Um, a couple of things about the movie True Grit, 1969. Okay, so a couple of things about the development of this movie. Go ahead. That I found out. Here's just a series of facts about it that I think are very, very interesting. Some of these are not going to be surprising, mm -hmm. I feel. Uh, John Wayne lobbied for the part after reading the book. Oh, like, good. He really liked he Rooster. Liked book? He really wanted to play Rooster. Uh, the script was written by Marguerite Roberts. Mm -hmm. A lady. Yeah. So that's good. It is good. Now, John Wayne said... Quote, this is the best script he'd ever read. Okay. He lobbied really, really hard to get her script approved for the movie mm -hmm. and also for her to get the sole credit that she deserved. Now, normally, like on his other movies, he would always have his own screenwriters kind of finessing the script to make them more John Wayne centric. Okay. Which like, I hear, like that still happens to this day. Sure. This is after she had already been blacklisted for like leftist tendencies oh right and he's and he was super conservative yeah so like apart from all that he loved it enough that he was just like no i this is what it should be she wrote it it's great i love it kim darby was not the original maddie oh no she was not originally considered there were a bunch of actresses that were considered for maddie before her okay mia farrow was originally cast as maddie how old would mia farrow have been in 1969 this was so she would already have played a married pregnant woman and now she would be playing a child. A 14-year-old. That's so weird. She, her, she, basically she worked on a movie with Robert Mitchum and Robert Mitchum was telling her about the director of True Grit, Henry Hathaway, who had directed many, many Westerns. Mm -hmm. which had been working for a long time. And he says, he is very hard to work with. You should not work with him. So she went to Halby Wallace, the producer of True Grit, and said, I don't want to work with him. You should replace him with a different director who I just worked with no. on Rosemary's Baby. Was this almost a Roman Polanski movie? Uh, no, because Halby Wallace said, no, I'm not going to do that. Fantastic. And, and she quit. That is for the best. So, and I honestly, if you went to Mia Farrow today, she'd probably be like, that was for the best. I don't know. I mean, she's... Is she, is, she a, is she a Polanski apologist? That would make me feel bad because I think highly of her. I'm certainly going to find out later. Yeah. It wouldn't surprise me if she was a Polanski apologist. I mean, she's a definitely a Woody Allen detractor. So I guess yeah. that makes me think she's a Polanski detractor as well. Uh, I wouldn't make that assumption. I guess I don't need to make that assumption. Yeah. Ugh. Okay. Okay. Now, now I feel bad. Tell me a good thing. Okay. He refused to do that, so she quit. Okay. Then John Wayne did like a talent show. And he met Karen Carpenter. Oh. And said he wanted her. They didn't even consider her because she had no acting experience. Oh, bless her. A couple other actresses that were that were considered. Uh, he really wanted, he, they considered his daughter Aisa. So like, John Wayne's daughter? John Wayne's daughter. Okay. Almost. How do you spell Aisa? A-I-S-S-A. -S -S -A. Okay. And also Sally Field. All right. I can I, actually see that. I would have been fine with that. Okay. But they eventually went with Kim Darby. Yes. Was she an unknown or had she had previous experience? I don't think she'd had much previous experience, but I don't think she was unknown. Yeah. It's also worth it. It's also worth mentioning she was 22. Yeah, she was 22. When she played this 14-year-old. Yeah. There was one other piece of casting that did not happen that was considered. Who do you think was considered for the role of Labeef? In 1969? I'm going to give you two hints. I have an idea. I'm going to give you two hints okay. and you tell me what you think. Can I make a guess before you give me the hint? Sure. Robert Redford. No. Oh. No. You should have let me give you your hints. I'm very sorry. Give me the hints, please. Hint number one. It is the 60s. Okay. Hint number two. Glenn Campbell, is a, a singer. famous singer, was, uh, was finally cast in the role. I have an idea. Who is it? John Lennon. No. Oh. No, 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 no. Oh. Who would play a Southern man? Johnny Cash? Elvis Presley. No. Well, oh, I mean, that makes sense, actually. Elvis Presley did a million movies. Right? He did not play LaBeef. Because he beefed it. No. He oh, he didn't play LaBeef because his agent demanded top billing. <laughs> and like I said, we are now interacting with the modern American mythology of John Wayne. That's right. No one, even Elvis Presley, asks for top billing over John Wayne. That's right. So he was, he did not get the part. Uh-huh. 
And the part went to Glenn Campbell. Yes, who also sang the theme song. Yeah, which was written by the composer Elmer Bernstein mm-hmm. and lyricist Don Black. May I read you a lyric from the theme song? <laughs> I would love for you to. The pain of it will ease a bit when you find a man with true grit. It's a terrible song. It's the fucking worst. Like, I I really enjoyed this movie. And people love this movie. And like, okay, top 10 westerns of all time. One of the greatest John Wayne performances. Like, sure, people love it. And there's this like raw raw masculinity john wayne i love cowboys whole holy shit and the planes kind of thing in this country <laughs> and the planes <laughs> and the tumbleweeds there, there's that whole community of people love this movie mm-hmm, mm-hmm. but while being very good there's some parts of it that kind of have escaped unexamined okay uh and Such one of them as? Is, like the song is terrible it's really bad i don't mean examined from like a social perspective i just mean unexamined from a quality perspective yeah the do song's want, terrible do you want me to read that lyric again yes please <laughs> the pain of it will ease a bit when you find a man with true grit it's so stupid it's a very stupid song and feels totally out of place in the movie one last thing and this is about the director henry hathaway you're smiling but like in a bad way yeah Okay. Oh, no. What did he do? He didn't do anything, but he said some stuff. <laughs> oh, no. About Kim Darby. No. Who played Maddie Ross. No. Who I thought she was very good. She was very good and honestly pretty believable as a 14-year-old. I oh. disagree with that. Okay. She's 20. Like, I she's mean, clearly fine. not 14. But they, like, aged up the parents. Yeah. Like the parents were very old and also had a newborn. That you're, didn't make sense to you're me. You're not letting me get to my thing. I'm so sorry. Well, I don't know that I want to know. Okay, go ahead. Quote, my problem with her, they did not get along when they were making this movie. Yeah. My problem with her was simple. She's not particularly attractive. So her book of tricks consisted mostly of being a little cute. All through the film, I had to stop her from acting funny, doing bits of business and so forth. So maybe... I don't have anything to say about that. Maybe Robert Mitchum was right when he told Nia Farrow, you shouldn't work with this guy. Uh, Kim Darby loved John Wayne, though. She seems really cool. We saw a couple of interviews with her like now, and she's like a very cool older lady yeah. like that looks like she used to be a hippie. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah, she's no. got like little glasses and like big curly hair. There, there's like so much stuff I found out about the making of the movie. So like, okay, um, Dennis Hopper is in this movie. Yes. And he had worked with Hathaway earlier that like in the decade, mm-hmm. earlier in the 60s. And he had this total like, so Dennis Hopper was in Rebel Without a Cause with James Dean. Okay. And like fancied himself a new James Dean. Sure. So sure. He, he told this story about doing a Henry Hathaway movie earlier in the 60s where he did like, he made him do 80 takes of a scene before he finally let Hathaway say, you've got it, we're done. And Hathaway said some real mean shit about him. But I guess they buried the hatchet because then Dennis Hopper appears as Moon, the young outlaw mm-hmm. who beefs it. He gets his fingers cut off. He gets his fingers cut off and then he gets stabbed, stabbed in the gut. Stabbed by his pard. Uh, it's 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 real sad. Yeah. Uh, he was in True Grit, so they apparently buried the hatchet. Yeah. Apparently, there were like crazy screaming fights between Robert Duvall and Hathaway. Great. Because Robert Duvall plays Lucky Ned Pepper. I hate that. And I, I hate that. Like, you're an actor. Like, you have an artistic temperament or whatever. But like, at the end of the day, like, you're in your workplace. But maybe it's Hathaway. Like, do you? I know. Well, that's what I'm talking about him too. Like, you're a director, or whatever. Like, do you have screaming fights with anyone in your workplace? No. Like, no. Why is it okay to do that on a movie set? I know. I find that terrible. Because it's art. I I find that terrible. I know. I don't like it either. So um, John Wayne basically took over. Yeah. As the director? No, no, not as the director. Just as the lead person. Apparently he was real cool and real prepared and real nice to everybody. And Kim Darby really, really liked it. I mean, my impression of John Wayne, yeah, like, yeah, he was like an arch conservative. And yeah, like, I'm sure he probably espoused some views that i disagree with but like my impression of john wayne is that he was like a goddamn professional that wants to just show up and do his job yeah okay we talked about the development and some of the actors what else do you want to say about the 1969 john wayne film true grit i feel like for everything that we're saying about how it's not really maddie's story anymore Mm -hmm. like it kind of becomes john wayne's story it's subtle like I honestly think that development is kind of subtle. Yeah. Like it's still Maddie's story. She's still the main character. Rooster is still technically a supporting character. It's just that the way the movie is made kind of supports John Wayne being the lead. Sure. But it's still Maddie's story. Yeah. You still care about her more than anyone else. Yeah, like she's not written 
out of the story like in any significant way yeah yeah i think her perspective is taken away a little bit Hmm. um we don't i don't think we get that first person perspective with her that we get with the book no i think you're right and i don't mean just because like she's not narrating it no it's just how the movie was made yeah um it's really good like as far as i'm not i'm not the biggest western fan in the world but i'm certainly not like illiterate when it comes to westerns yeah it's really good can i tell you something yeah i don't think i've ever seen a john wayne movie before this some of them are really good i don't believe i ever have like i I don't think i've ever i mean i know who john wayne is obviously mm -hmm. but like i don't believe i've ever actually seen a john wayne film you should see i enjoyed it i think you should see the searchers all right i think that's the one to see like so henry hathaway has directed a ton of westerns but like the thing i get from true grit this is i hope this is like somewhat on the money it feels like he's trying to be john ford I don't really know who that is. He directed The Searchers. Okay. He's a, he's a very he's a big old Western director. I see. He's very good. Okay. He's very, 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 very good. Uh, no, True Grit's good. Like, I don't think True Grit necessarily succeeds because of craft. No. Like, I don't think it's this incredibly well put together movie. I do think the script is good. Well, no, that's the thing. I think it's capturing certain elements. So, like, the script is very good because mm-hmm. it's based on the book, which is very good. Yes. John Wayne's in it, who, good or bad, like, John Wayne isn't good or bad. John Wayne is just John Wayne. Yeah. And that means, am I literally quoting The Birdcage? <laughs> I don't know, are What's you? What's the line from The Birdcage? He's, he's, if anyone was a man. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. John Wayne, no, I mean it, though. Like, John Wayne's not good or bad. He's just John Wayne. Yeah. When you want John Wayne in a movie, you get John Wayne, and now you have John Wayne. Congratulations, you have John Wayne. Cool. Like, he won an Oscar for this. I don't see any reason why this is the performance he wins an Oscar for. Not because, like, it's bad. It's just because it's the same as all his other no, performances. No, I, I think it's more like, in 1969, they were finally ready to give John Wayne an Oscar, and this was the movie he was in that year. I think that makes. I think that's exactly what's going on. I mean, that, that's on. why Scorsese won Best Director for The Departed. Yeah. Like, 100%. Totally. The Departed sucks. I'm sorry. We maybe just, <laughs> lo- lost, we maybe just lost a couple of our hard-won new dad listeners, but I hate The Departed. I think... Look, here's the deal. The Southie Bros, I, I, I'm friends with some Southie Bros. Yeah, I am too. Yeah, Southie Bros are great. If, if any of you are, are part of our Southie Bro constituency, we apologize for our opinion on The Departed. They filmed part of it in my dad's office building where he works. Interesting. Yeah, in the library at Suffolk Law School. Yeah, yeah. I also don't like it. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of it. Yeah. So that's John Wayne. Yes. Kim Darby, we already said, I think she's really good. Mm-hmm. Glenn Campbell. Yeah. He's doing his goddamn best. He's all right. He's He's not good at all. (laughs) I think he's very, very bad in this movie. But that's not his thing. Like, Glenn Campbell's a singer. Yeah. You know? Like, here's... song he's very good can you also please play a clip of the theme song from true grit that song so much like glenn campbell's really really good at the thing he does he's not good at the thing he doesn't which is acting yeah and also like a big difference between the 1969 movie of true grit and the book labeef beefs it he oh he beefs it yeah for Total. sure and like he labeefs it in the worst <laughs> way like okay so in the book he gets hit in the head with a rock but then he wakes up and helps rooster save maddie from like, the hole okay. yeah in this one it's exactly the same thing except at the end of the scene he just suddenly falls over dead yeah or there's this like throwaway line that like um rooster's like oh, oh he died on us that idiot and i wonder what the thought process was because it's 
like it's almost literally almost no different from the book. It's literally almost no different from the 2010 version, which spoiler alert, Labeef doesn't Labeef it. And <laughs> he I know that you enjoy that. Like, I don't know why he had to die other than I think they probably thought that the audiences would be concerned if, as in the book, Rooster and Maddie just kind of leave Labeef behind. Yeah, they wanted to wrap up his story. So he has to die. Yeah, no, I think that is true. That's what I was thinking. Um, so in the book, Labeef lives, but Rooster dies like 25 years later. Yeah. In the movie, Labeef, Labeef's it. And then Rooster's fine. And the movie doesn't do that 25 year ahead jump. No, it does like sort of a six months ahead jump. Yeah, like Maddie's a little bit better and her arm is full, still fully attached to her body, but in a sling. <laughs> in a sling. And he takes her home, which doesn't happen in the book. Right. Because basically after her arm gets cut off, she never sees him again. Yeah. And he takes her home and they have this really nice thing where they're like, we have a connection and we love each other. Yeah. And we're family now. Would and- you like to be buried in my family plot? Yeah. Yes. And he says, no, I got to take a ride on the wind. Essentially, yeah. And then the movie ends because, of course, they wanted to leave it open for a sequel, which they did make in 1975 when he starred as Rooster Tr- Cogburn. True Grit 2. No, he starred as Rooster Cogburn in Rooster Cogburn. Of course he did. Do you know who else was in that movie? No. Catherine Hepburn. Good. Everything I've seen about it is that it's basically True Grit combined with the African Queen. Okay. And that's essentially Rooster Cogburn. Okay. But that does not happen. Like, that's not in the book at all. Like, he totally dies 25 years later, and it's sad. I think the movie succeeds, as I was saying, because of a cer- like a certain amount of people who really brought 100% of their creativity to it. So I think the screenplay is really, really good. I think John Wayne is really good. I think Kim Darby is really good. Robert Duvall as Ned Pepper is great. Yeah, he's great. He's He's good in almost everything he does. Jeff Corey as Tom Chaney is really good. They did a thing where, we talk about this all the time, but they did a thing where they age up a lot of the characters. Mm. Like Tom Chaney in the movie, he's supposed to be like 25. Yeah. But he's clearly like in his 50s. Yeah. He's not doing well <laughs> at all. But everyone's really, really good in it. And it does the plot. And the movie succeeds where the book succeeds, which is showing the relationships between the characters. Yeah. So even though I think it's not like the most well-crafted movie. Yeah, it's a good solid movie. It's a good solid movie and it does the thing it's supposed to, which is shows the relationship between the characters. Yes. Punctuated by plot. Yes. Not I agree. the other way around. I agree. But that's that's all I really have to say about the 1969 version. Do you have anything else to say about no, it? No, I would like to move on. Did you enjoy it? I did. I thought it was very good and I would recommend anybody watch it. Cool. Cool. So in 2010... Some, you know, indie unknowns named the Coen brothers (laughs) made this movie True Grit. Um, And I'm looking at the back of the box and we don't always read both, but I think this is an interesting contrast uh, in who it sets up as the main character. So I'd like you to read this, please, if, if you don't mind. Sure. True Grit is a powerful story of vengeance and valor set in an unforgiving and unpredictable frontier where justice is simple and mercy is rare. Maddie Ross, Haley Steinfeld, I'll read the actors is determined to avenge her father's blood by capturing Tom Chaney, Josh Brolin, the man who shot and killed him for two pieces of gold. Just 14, she enlists the help of Rooster Cogburn, Academy Award winner Jeff Bridges, a one-eyed, trigger-happy U.S. Marshal with an affinity for drinking, and hardened Texas Ranger Labeef, Academy Award winner Matt Damon, to track the fleeing Chaney. Despite their differences, their ruthless determination leads them on a perilous adventure that can only have one outcome, retribution. So I just want to mention... I know why you wanted me to read that. Yeah, I just want to mention, like, the difference between um, the... This is very interesting, actually. The difference between these two covers. So True Grit 1969 has a picture of just John Wayne. But the actors it lists are John Wayne, Glenn Campbell, Kim Darby. Which I think is right. Like, those are the three main characters of the story True Grit. Yes. The one from 2010. And Kim Darby was kind of an unknown. Like, I don't think she was famous but she was above the title because she was one of the three main characters and also a grown woman and also a grown woman but the picture is just john wayne again yes again modern mythology john wayne that's fair so the 2010 version the picture is four individuals which is maddie rooster labeef and tom cheney but the names above the title are jeff bridges matt damon josh brolin so I'm super salty that Haley Steinfeld, though her image is on the cover of this, and though she is written into the blurb on the back as the main character, her name does not appear above the title. And you said it's because she's a child and an unknown. And I think that 
that shouldn't matter because if you're playing the main character, you should be on the front cover. I both agree with you and also think that that's not how things work. I disagree. I I appreciate that. Uh, The only other example I can give, like child actors never get their name above the title. Like it ne- it almost never happens because the way the names are on the cover, like it's all it's all the agents, it's all contract negotiations. So like Haley Joel Osment is the is one of the reasons people love the Sixth Sense, but like his name was never on the poster. I think that's wrong. Like, I disagree. He was nominated for an Academy Award I for it. I know. That's what I'm saying. I agree with you. But that's the thing. I agree <laughs> with you that it's wrong. Yes, I think Haley Steinfeld's name should be on the top. And all the adults' names should be under the title. Yes. That, unfortunately, is not how things work. Well. And here we are. Here we are. But, as you said before, the original back of the box was basically, oh, this is Rooster's story. Yeah. And he meets a girl named Maddie. Yes. But that's not what this one does. Actually, the original box is even worse than what you just said because it doesn't even say her name. It just says a young girl. Totally true. But this one, she is the subject of the sentence where the verb is hires Rooster Cogburn. Not is hired by. Correct. All right. What did you think of this movie? When I originally saw it? Yes. I liked it. Yes. What did you think of it this time through? Holy shit, it's so fucking good. It's really good. This keeps happening to me where like I see a movie. I feel like any movie should completely stand on its own. The problem is that's not really how life works. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the movies I love, I love them because of the context in which they were made. Sure. And I think this is a movie that is much, much better when you know the context of it. Mm -hmm. I think if you have never read the book and you've never seen the original movie and you see this, it's very, very good. Yeah. But then when you compare it to the book and compare it to the original movie, holy shit, this is a fucking masterpiece. Yeah. It's like almost, I would call this like almost a perfect movie. It's really good. Almost a perfect movie and one of the best adaptations I've ever seen. Yeah, because they don't follow the book like slavishly like they definitely changed some stuff around especially with like the beef's involvement to make it sort of more just about rooster and maddie well that's the thing like okay so if this book is about two different things it's about the characters specifically maddie who is telling the book in first person and it's about the plot which is just the actions that happen in an adaptation which should you adhere more towards should you which which should you be more beholden to i feel like this is a trick question the characters of course yeah and in the original book, they basically tone down the character of Maddie and her first person perspective, but basically stick with the plot 100%. Sure. But in the new one, they change a whole bunch of stuff around in the plot. Yeah. Like there's some real key differences. It's not crazy different. It's not crazy. It's, not, it's just mostly they kind of conflate a couple things and like Labeef for some of the events is just not there. Right. But that allows them to focus even more on Maddie That's right. as the main character. That's right. So, like, I actually think it does some stuff with the character that doesn't even happen in the book. Yeah. Because, okay, I, let, let me see where this goes for a second. Okay. Because I haven't had to say this out loud before. So, in the book, seeing what's going on inside Maddie's head is really, really easy because she's actually telling it in first person, right? Yes. Okay. In the movie... The entire, like, prologue of the movie, it's this gorgeous shot. I just, I want to say really, really quickly, from, like, a film craft perspective, Roger Deakins shot this, Mm -hmm. who, like, you know, we talked about, you know, finally giving someone an Oscar. Yeah. Like, he finally got his Oscar, and he's one of the best cinematographers who has ever lived. Uh Uh-huh. He's incredible and has been working with the Coens for decades now. Yeah. The op- do you remember the opening shot of yeah, the 2010 yeah, yeah, yeah. version? Can I describe it? Yeah. Um. So in the, I just want to give us a contrast to the 1969 version. Um. You actually, unlike the book, you actually see her father. He's a character. You see him leaving home in 1969. In 1969. Yep. You see him going to Fort Smith. You see him arguing with Tom Cheney, and you see the whole thing. You don't see it through Maddie's eyes. You just see it objectively through Ar- your own eyes. Yeah. Arguably, objectively. But in this, you have Maddie as an adult. This is what I thought was really cool about it. It wasn't Ma- it wasn't Haley Steinfeld's voice. It was the actor who played her as an adult, um, I believe, doing this narration. And it's basically just the first couple pages of the book, you know, edited down. Um, but it's just this like it almost black and white shot of her father's body just sort of crumpled on the street with the light from the saloon illuminating him from the back and the camera is just slowly 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 moving in as you hear 
this narration of what happened to to make this this so so from the very beginning you're already seeing it through her eyes because it's as if she's because she never saw this happen but it's her imagine her imagination of what what did happen yeah totally yeah it's like one of the best visual interpretations of a passage like this i think i've ever seen yeah it's really good well and the other thing too that you get from it is that unlike so the 1969 version is um 100 in real time there's no like flashback or anything like that there's no voiceover so what you get is sort of the equivalent to call me ishmael you know that maddie survives the story from the very first line Mm -hmm. because you hear her as an adult saying when i she doesn't say when i was a child she just says like the year but like in such and such year the coward Tom Chaney shot my father down in cold blood and I went to Fort Smith to avenge him or whatever the line is. But you know that she's going to make it because you hear her as an adult from the very first moment of the movie. Totally. All right. But I, I, I want to get back to what I was to what I wanted to finish. Yeah. Because I want to I don't want to lose this train of thought. So in like I was saying in the book, you get to see Maddie's perspective because you're hearing her in the first person. Right. In the movie, even though you hear her a bit in the beginning and there is some voiceover throughout, you don't get her perspective as kind of crystal clear as you do in the book. Mm -hmm. So what you have to do is you have to show her actions and her decisions. Yes. The movie expands on her time in the town Mm. and shows so many more actions that she's taking. Yeah. So like one of the first things that happens, because in the book, she gets to the town, the, the town's full up. So she goes to stay at like a, I want to say a and b The Monarch Boarding House. A boarding house. That's what it is, not a and b um, A B&B. I, I mean, it is basically a and b I felt stupid saying it. So she goes to stay at the boarding house, and there aren't enough rooms, so she has to sleep in a bed with an old lady. Okay, that's a thing in the book. In the movie, she does eventually go there, but she spends her first night in town sleeping, like, in the morgue. Yeah. Like, in the Undertaker's... With the bodies. With, with all the bodies. It's great because it shows how pragmatic she is. Mm -hmm. Even though that's something that maybe the character wouldn't have done in the book, it still gives us as an audience more insight into who she is as a character Mm -hmm. because it's showing her actions and her decisions. Yeah. And that's just one example. There's a whole bunch of things that are added in her time in the town that show us that stuff that aren't in the book. Yeah, like um, when Rooster's in the outhouse and she's like banging on the door trying to talk to him. That is not in the book, but not, it's amazing. Oh, my God. But it does so much to let us know who the focus of the story is on. Yes. Maddie is the one we see. And when we meet Rooster, we don't see him because he's in an outhouse. You yeah. never see his face. He's just basically until she sees him in the courtroom, she has this image in her head of who Rooster is. Yeah. And then we get to see her meet him in the courtroom and see him for the first time. And it's also us seeing and meeting him for the first time. That's right. And right. I think it's just, it's a brilliant introduction. Yeah. Like I, like I said, character introductions are great. I love that you don't even see him for his first scene. Yeah. The thing that I said to you while we were watching is that it really seemed to me, and I love the Coen brothers. I like a lot of their movies. Some of them I don't like as much as others. But you like Big Lebowski enough to to make up for the ones you don't like we also, as much. Yes. Also Fargo. We watched Fargo on our first date. It's not a good first date movie. I don't recommend it. Um, well, we didn't watch the whole thing. Don't say that. We made out on our first date. <laughs> and then we heard the wood chipper scene from the other room. And it and ruined the mood. It really did. 100%. But now we're married. And that just set the tone for our whole relationship. But you like the Coen brothers a lot. Yeah. That's uh, the short version. Yes. And the thing that I got from this is that they, reading this book, took the same delight from the way that language is used in the book as I did because some of my favorite lines were just in there word for word and sometimes they even put them in twice just to really hammer home how good it was like um at the very beginning when Maddie is um viewing her father like at the undertakers in Fort Smith the undertaker just says if you would like to kiss him it would be all right no that's not what he says yes it is if you would like to kiss him it would be all right. Okay, yes. he's In this movie, he's Irish for some reason. It's, it is a great line in the yeah. book. And she's like, no, put the cover on him. And But in the movie, he says it again. But it's such a good line and such a good example of like, no, why would I want to do that? Like, that's just such a characteristic of Maddie. Like, he's dead. Why would I want to kiss him? Like, I'm very sad that this happened. But like, this would serve no purpose. Mm-hmm. Why would I do that? Totally. Um. And then, um, I mean, I'm jumping ahead, but the scene at the end where she, because this is not in the 1969 movie, where she she 
goes to meet Rooster and she's so excited and she's just disappointed because he died like literally three days before. And she goes to meet him at like a traveling Old West show. He's in this like he wrote to her and said like I'm in this Old West show you know you should take the train to come see me he's like in Memphis or something. So this is the other dramatic reading I wanted to do. Maybe this would be a good time. Yeah. Is that in order, okay? In order to set this up, I want to say one quick thing about casting. Yes. So they cast an actress named Elizabeth Marvel as as old Maddie. Oh, I didn't realize that was Elizabeth Marvel. I know who Elizabeth Marvel is. She's amazing. Oh, shit. What do you know her from? I know her from acting on the... Bro- <laughs> <laughs> okay. I know her from the Broadway. Okay. Like, what in particular? Uh, She was in a production of The Little Foxes that I saw. Ah. That was amazing. Um, She works a lot with a director called Ivo Van Hova. Oh, shit. You love him. Yes, who I love. He's one of my favorite, like, avant-garde directors. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Well, I have a question for you. Yes. How many arms does she have? In the movie? No. How many arms does that actress have? In real life? Yeah. She has two. Yes. The character only has one. Only one. So... uh, they didn't do any, like, trickery. They just bound her arm up? No, other than they cast a different actress to be the body. Oh, seriously? Yes. Oh. So they found... She's actually... She's not an actress. She, she's a social worker. Okay. She was born without that, that part of her arm. Okay. Her name is Ruth Morris. The cool thing is... So in all of the, like, wide shots, it's Ruth Morris. Okay. In all of the close-ups, it's uh, Elizabeth Marvel. Yeah. Ruth Morris technically has more screen time than Elizabeth Marvel does. I think that's a really cool way of doing that. I think it's great. I think that's really kind of inclusive of people with like limb differences Mm -hmm. to be like, no, we're not going to CGI it. Like, let's just have a person that that's their body. I think that's great. I it wouldn't surprise me if they had actually tried to get someone who could do both. Yeah, and maybe maybe they weren't happy with the performances. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I'm making wild assumptions. Elizabeth Marvel's amazing. I didn't realize this was Elizabeth Marvel. I I don't think I've ever seen her face that close up because I generally am in the cheap seats. Do you want to watch it again now? Kind of. Yeah, because that whole first scene, that whole monologue at the beginning about her father getting shot, that's her. That's great. Yeah. Can I read the scene? Yes. Okay. So just to recap once more. Rooster's performing in a Wild West show. It's like 25 years later. He's written to her to say, I'll be in your neck of the woods. Come see me. And she's taking the train. And the two guys that she's about to mention are part of the Wild West show. I found Cole Younger and Frank James sitting in a Pullman car in their shirt sleeves. They were drinking Coca-Colas and fanning themselves. They were old men. I suppose Rooster must have aged a good deal, too. These old timers had all fought together in the border strife under Quantrill's black standard and afterward led dangerous lives. And now this was all they were fit for to show themselves to the public like strange wild beasts of the jungle. They claim Younger carried 14 bullets about in various portions of his flesh. He was a stout, florid man with a pleasant manner and he rose to greet me. The waxy James remained in his seat and did not speak or remove his hat. Younger told me that Rooster had passed away a few days before, while the show was at Jonesboro, Arkansas. He had been in failing health for some months, suffering from a disorder he called (laughs) Night Hoss, and the heat of the early summer had been too much for him. Younger reckoned his age at 68 years. There was no one to claim him, and they had buried him in the Confederate Cemetery in Memphis, though his home was out of Osceola, Missouri. Younger spoke fondly of him. We had some lively times, was one thing he said. I thanked the courteous old outlaw for his help and said to James, keep your seat, trash, and took my leave. (laughs) They think now it was Frank James who shot the bank officer in Northfield. As far as I know, that scoundrel never spent a night in jail, and there was Cole Younger locked away 25 years in the Minnesota pen. I just love that she calls him trash. It's amazing. I love Maddie Ross. She's so good. So what I think we should do yes. to talk about this new movie, mm-hmm. we've talked about a whole bunch of stuff about it, but we haven't really gotten into like the little bits and pieces of it. Yeah. I want to go through the cast really quickly. Great. And get kind of your opinions on the people that cast in That's this. great. So I want to start kind of at the bottom. Yeah. With some, some little characters. Okay. Kind of the littlest one. Okay. But I really like, so Moon is that young outlaw. Who gets his fingers chopped off. Yeah. He's played by Dennis Hopper in yep. 1969. Mm-hmm. And I think he's great. Yes. He is played in this one by Donald Gleason. Yes. I love him in his one scene. Yeah, like the whole thing is that like he has been shot in this shootout and he's like terrified and Rooster is trying to get him to rat on Ned Pepper and tell him Ned Pepper's plans. And he's being like 
he's telling him like, hey, you know, that leg, it's going to turn to gangrene pretty darn soon. Like, you better tell me and I'll get you to the doctor. And his buddy is like, no, no, don't tell him anything. So he's like kind of between a rock and a hard place. And he finally gets scared and tells Rooster everything he knows. And his buddy gets enraged and chops off his fingers and then stabs him. And he and then Rooster shoots the buddy. So the buddy dies and then Moon dies. Basically, when Moon gets stabbed and he's on the ground, he says what I think is a great line. He just says, oh, Lord, I am dying. Yeah. And it's such a simple thing. The way Donald Gleason delivers the line, it's so helpless. Yeah. He, he delivers it like a child. Yeah. Oh, Lord, I'm dying. Do something. Help me. I can do nothing for you, son. Your partner's killed you and I've done for him. I think it's just a really great example of delivering the dialogue in a way that was better than I would have expected. Yeah. Yeah. And again, like this dialogue, I wouldn't be surprised if the Coen brothers basically like just extracted all of the dialogue from the book and then used as much of it as they could. Totally. Like that wouldn't surprise me if that was their process. And I know they're very, very specific about their dialogue. There's a really good... There's a really funny story that I heard about um, when they were shooting Fargo. Uh, Peter Stormara is in a lot of their movies, and he is Swedish. Like, English is not his first language. Um, it's like the head nihilist yeah, in Big Lebowski. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he's in. He's one of the two dudes in Fargo, like the two criminals in Fargo. Uh, well, there's more than two, but you know what I mean. He's not the funny looking one. Yeah, he's not the funny looking one. Um, and there's a line in the dialogue that's like, we go pancakes house. And Peter Stormara changed it to like, we're going to the pancake house because he thought, oh, this isn't, this is a typo. Like this isn't right. And they like stopped the, stopped the shot and said like, hey, like that's not dialogue. And he was like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, you know, English is not my first language, but I just thought that was a typo. And they were, the Coen brothers were like, no, no, what we want you to say is what's on the page. Like you're going to say it the way we, we wrote it that way. You're just going to say it that way. They're extremely specific about what they put on the page and what they want to hear. They're not improvisational directors is what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. No, I, th- I think the, the best example I have of kind of the care they take in the rhythms of dialogue mm-hmm. is uh, there's a great, so there's a great YouTube series called Every Frame of Painting. Yeah. I think we've referenced it before. I think so. But um, it's it's made by a, an editor. His name's Tony Zhu. Um, and he did one that was all about the Coen brothers. I'm going to link to it in the show notes. But it's a great example of how much care they take in the editing and the writing of their dialogue. Yeah. I I really, really like it. Yeah. Okay. So that's Moon. Then as Lucky Ned Pepper, we have Barry Pepper. I like, I was, I like freaked out. I was like, wait, what? His name is Pepper? Is playing a character called Pepper? And you were like, babe, I told you that before. I was like, I didn't remember. I think every time I see Barry Pepper in anything that isn't Battlefield Earth. I've never seen Battlefield Earth. He's the lead. Okay. He's the one. I thought John Travolta was the lead. He's the lead human. Okay. Yeah. Every time I see him in anything that isn't that, I'm happy for him. Because I'm, in the same way, I'm happy for everyone in anything good that they've done that isn't Battlefield Earth. Is he a Scientologist or did he just was is he just an actor that got a role? Best to my knowledge, he's a working goddamn actor. That's fine. He's really, really good. Yeah. He's also in like Saving Private Ryan. That's fine. He's in lots of stuff. He's, he's, he's got quite a jawline on him. He's really, really good. I actually think this is one where I'm going to give the performance to Robert Duvall. Mm. I th- oh, I didn't realize we were doing this. Okay. I wasn't thinking that we were either. But now I guess we are. Like, I think Robert Duvall... No, he's very good. The yeah. the thing that I liked better about Robert Duvall, um, no, I guess they honestly, I think they the the relationship with Maddie. But now that I think about it, I kind of liked how both of them did it. Like they were both like very charmed by her. Yeah, the biggest knock I have against Barry Pepper is that he's not Robert Duvall. But yeah. I feel like very few actors would be yeah, offended by unfair. me saying that. Yeah, that seems yeah. unfair. Yeah, it's big big woolly britches to fill. All right, let's jump up to Tom Chaney himself. Oh boy, Josh Brolin. I really like the fact that uh, Josh Brolin like is at least appears more age appropriate for Tom Chaney. Yeah. I, I like the idea that Tom Chaney's actually kind of a younger guy. Yeah. Whereas in the 1969 movie, he's like quite a bit older than everybody. Yeah. Another thing I appreciate is like Josh Brolin is kind of a heartthrob and he definitely like gunked himself up to play this role. He's he's like an animal. Yeah. He's, we were watching one of the features and they described him as being like animalistic. The, the costume designer was like, I, I wanted him to be like an animal. Like he's very animalistic in yes. this. And he delivers your favorite line. Yes, he does. Really well. I like, honestly, just on that line, I like the guy in 1969. I thought it was funnier. Totally fair. Yeah. I think that's totally fair. 
Let's jump up to Labeef. I didn't realize we were doing this. Okay. Uh, l- I don't think there's any comparison. Yeah. Like, Glenn Campbell's not good. Well, Matt Damon's great. He's fun. He's great, but he's also, like, in much less of it. Honestly, I think at the at the end of the day, he's not in that much less. But he... I, that's probably fair. But also, the thing I was about to say was, like, he also gets... <laughs> sort of more dramatic stuff happened to him like he gets annihilated by the in this fight like he gets dragged behind a horse and has like his teeth knocked out he is hurt his teeth are fine his teeth are so good he almost bites his own tongue off oh god and like roosters reaching into his <laughs> mouth to pull his tongue out Aww. and he's talking he's talking like this for the rest of the movie yeah i just i this was one thing i did remember from seeing it the first time i just delighted so much in seeing labeef accept punishment yeah because he's such a dandy yeah it's delightful yeah i'm pretty over matt damon but yeah i think he's really really good in this yeah i just mean as a human being no i know what you mean yeah yeah we don't need to get into it then we get jeff bridges yes as reuben rooster cogburn if anyone has anything bad to say about jeff bridges like please don't tell me he's one of those guys that i'm just like (sighs) if it turned out he was an asshole or a predator or something very negative i would be upset because he seems great and I like him. I feel like I bring up the word like compelling. Yeah. And charismatic. Yeah. He's maybe one of the most compelling and charismatic actors I think I've ever seen. Yeah. He's so good. Yeah. He does he has this old man thing that he's he does. De- he's definitely doing his he's definitely doing his old man thing where he's kind of jutting his jutting his, his, his lower his chin out uh, yeah where he says all his lines but i think that might just be him now because we saw him in an interview and he was kind of doing the same thing yeah a bit yeah the thing i like about jeff bridges as rooster versus john wayne is that john wayne's playing john wayne yeah. jeff bridges is playing rooster Cogburn. i agree with that yeah like he's I, I okay wait a second let me dial that back a bit yeah i think you might need to walk that back honestly now that i think about it he's playing jeff bridges but still playing the character more than john wayne was yes and i think he's willing he rooster as written in the book is a very grotesque character yeah i think jeff bridges is very willing to be grotesque yeah. i think john wayne is not yeah i mean there's a lot in the book about how he like smells bad and like you can definitely see this guy is like gross and smells bad like john wayne is clean shaven the entire movie yeah rooster cogburn doesn't sound like a person who would be clean shaven the entire time no. And that's just, like, one example. And he's, like, drunk half the time. Like, he's... Yeah. 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 Like, the scene that I love, just to show how drunk (laughs) Rooster is... Like, okay, in the 1969 version, he's drunk enough that he, like, falls off his horse once. Yeah. But in the 2010 version, they keep the scene that I love from the book where, like, all the men basically start... (laughs) <laughs> they're they throwing start, like cor- cornbread up in the air and shooting it they're all just trying to be marksmen and it is written <laughs> i think it's the funniest scene in the book yeah the way it's written where, where like every time they throw two up they like get one and miss the other or get one once it's on the ground and they actually put that scene in the movie yeah but how does it but the thing about maddie's character is the way that this like scene ends is maddie is like you men are idiots Please stop. You're wasting food and sh- wasting ammunition and you're this is not getting us any closer to Tom Chaney and you are stupid. Stop. I think that's a great transition. Yes. Let's talk about the most important character in this whole thing. Yes. What did you think of the guy in the bear suit? Okay. What did you think of <laughs> No, can we talk about the guy in the bear? <laughs> yeah, well, this is an example of like the Cohen brothers were like, okay, like we're adapting this novel and it's very good and very funny, but like we just need to put in a couple of real fucking weird things that are not in the book at all. So what they, are you talking about? They meet the he's a dentist, right? <laughs> yeah. In dressed in a bear skin. He has with a head. He has one scene. Yeah, the bear head is on top of it his head. It looks like a bear is riding a horse. He is it is one of the best scenes in the movie. Mm-hmm. It is like patent Cohen brothers. Yeah. Nothing of that is in the book. Yeah. But it feels like something that would have been in the book. Well, yes, I agree. And the other thing that it starts to do is that this whole book like takes place in Indian territory and this is one of the only conversations that they have with someone who is actually an Indian person. I'm not positive that he is. I know the actor's not. Okay. I think he's supposed to be, but I could be wrong. Okay. I'm not 100% sure. Maybe he's just lived amongst the Indian tribes? I am only 100% sure of two things. One, this scene is delightful. Yeah. And two, this guy is fucking weird. Can I say one other thing about the way that Indians are represented in this movie? Oh, yeah, please. Okay. So this is like literally the one thing I wrote down. (laughs) White man always keeping the Indian down. So at the beginning... Uh, I'm going all the way back to the beginning. 
they have the hanging scene like in its in full and it's the same kind of thing where there's three guys two white men and an Indian and the hangman basically says to all three of them do you have anything to say and one of the guys is just sobbing this is straight from the book one of the guys is just sobbing and can't really say anything the other one of the white guys has like this monologue that he's like Parents in the crowd, I say to you, if I had received good instruction as a child, I would not be in this place. I did this and I did that and I did this. It's like this long thing. And then he gets the hood put down over his head. And then there's then they come to the Indian and he's like, he's like very calmly like, I have something that I would like to say. And like interrupt in the middle of his sentence, he just gets the hood jammed down over his head. And from under the hood, you hear him start to like sing a song of his people and then they, re- it's very dark, but then they release the noose or whatever. It's, it's like that combination of dark and funny that I feel like the Coen brothers know how to do they better do than very most well. people. But that's what I, I just wrote. White man always keeping the Indian down. Like he had something he wanted to say it's and so he good. was not given the opportunity that the white man was. It's so good. It's so good. All right. Haley Steinfeld. What did you think? I am super excited that we did this after recording Romeo and Juliet. Because we didn't like her in that. Uh, she was not given good things to do no. or good direction. Indeed. She is so unbelievably good in this movie. Did she get an Oscar nomination for this? No. I thought Oh, okay. For some reason, I thought she did. Now I have to double check. She was. She was nominated for Best Supporting Actress. That's some fucking bullshit right there. Yep. Well, the thing is, like, right, isn't it true that, like, the per- the people that make the movie submit in the categories like there's no like judging body like it's just whatever the movie maker said so maybe they thought she would have a better chance in supporting actress i I think that's a huge part of it i think there's the whole thing where like animated films will get like the only i i guess i don't know if that's changed recently but like for years the only animated movie that was nominated for best picture was beauty and the beast Mm -hmm. but then they introduced the animated film category right and so then it became a thing where no i mean like if you want best picture you should and you've made an animated movie do best animated. Don't go for best picture because right. you won't get it. Right. But it's like, is it is it true that it's the decision of whoever made the movie? Because on Broadway, it's totally different. For the Tony Awards, they have like a committee that goes around and sees all the shows and determines who's eligible for best actor versus like best supporting actor. I wish I knew, uh-huh. um, but I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. I, I, think, I think you're right. Yeah. So anyway, that's bullshit because she's the lead. Yep. What'd you think of her in this? I thought she was great. The way that she embodied the character was great because basically the way that she comes across in the book is that she is very stoic, very sure of herself, and very put together until she's not. And then when she's not, she's a 14-year-old girl. Like One thing that I think is really important because we talk about this a lot is like when you have a character that's young but they're played by an actress that is older, Mm -hmm. the problem that can happen is they will play it younger but you can tell they're older, which makes the character seem really stunted. Right, which was not a problem in this case. No, but it is it is kind of a problem in 1969 because, mm. like, I look at Kim Darby, she looks like she's in her 20s. Yeah. So when she's acting like a child, she it, she's acting stunted. Yeah. And when you as a viewer have compassion for what's happening to a child, it's different than the compassion you have for something that's happened to someone who is an adult. Sure. You need the actress to actually be a child in order to feel compassion for Maddie the way you do in the book. Sure. More than other characters, I think. Also, she's supposed to be really... Precocious isn't the right word, but she's supposed to be very intelligent and self-possessed for her age. Yeah. If she's cast as someone who's in their 20s, she's not going to seem as composed and self-possessed. Sure. Because there's no, you don't have that juxtaposition. It doesn't feel weird. Yes, she I She just feels you. like a young woman who is very self-possessed. Right. She should feel interesting. Yeah. And I think Haley Steinfeld has that. Yeah. Well, and then the, like the whole thing with Chaney, he sees her. He's like, oh, it's little Maddie. Mm-hmm. Little Maddie. The little bookkeeper. And she's like, I'm going to shoot you dead. But she's a baby. You know? Like, like <laughs> you can see why he doesn't take her seriously because she is a child. Totally. I think she is so good in this. Yeah. So do you have final thought? The whole thing. Final thoughts. What are your thoughts? Um, I really, really enjoyed the book. Yeah. I thought the 1969 movie was not my thing, yeah. but super fun. It was fun. Fun is definitely the word I would use. Like, I, I don't consider it this, like, fantastic piece of filmmaking. Yeah. But it definitely is, like, lightning in a bottle. Yeah. There's great, great stuff that's in it. Yeah. I'm so impressed by the 2010 version. It's, I thought that was great. And I thought that it was, like, it was, like, the version of the movie I would have made 
because it clear the the filmmakers clearly were delighted by the same things in the book that I was delighted by and maybe kind of not as interested in the things that I wasn't as interested in. I think you're hitting on something that is one of the things I like most about it, mm-hmm. which is that the right filmmakers made it. Yeah. Whereas with the original, it is a it is a western, mm-hmm. quote unquote. So if a movie's going to be made, it should be made by people who make westerns. Yeah. But I don't actually think that that director was Like, I don't think the people that made the movie were necessarily the right people to handle the story. Yeah. Well, when we were watching it, I said to you at one point, do you think John Wayne knows it's a comedy? And you were like, yeah, he does. And I was like, I'm not sure. And then like later he like fell off the horse or something. And I was like, okay, no, he knows it's a comedy. But then I thought about it some more. And I said to you like, no, I think I know what it is. I'm not sure the director knows it's a comedy. And I think that's what it was. Like, I think the director sees it as like a story of retribution in the Old West, and it has funny stuff in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's he doesn't see it as a comedy. Mm-hmm. The Coen brothers see this as a comedy. Sure, of course. It's like a, a comedy punctuated with like intense drama and right. peril, but it is a comedy. Totally. It's a character study in a comedy. Totally. So I really, really enjoyed it. Do yeah. you want to do those quadrants? Yeah. Um. No, I mean, the last thing I was going to say was like... Oh, I'm so sorry. I, no, it's fine. The last thing I was going to say was like, I'm not sure since we, d- we did... um. Murder on the Orient Express, have we done an episode that I so thoroughly enjoyed everything, like book and all the movies. Just enjoyed watching all of them. Totally. It was really delightful. I'm right there with you. Yeah, Yeah. totally. Do you want to do the quadrants? Yeah, let's do it. Fantastic. 1969, True Grit. Do you think they cared about the source material? Yes. I do too. I do. And I think they cared about it because it was super popular and everyone read it and John Wayne really liked it. And this became kind of a passion project for him. It seems like everyone really cared about it. My knock is that maybe not everyone involved was the best person chosen to do that material. Sure. But I do think everyone cared about the Mm -hmm. material. Do you think they did a good job? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Maybe closer to the line, but yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's true grit. It's like one of the best John Wayne movies. Yeah. And it's beloved for a reason. Yeah. It's it's very good. I do think, I do give props to John Wayne for, even though I think his portrayal of the character didn't go as far as it needed to based on what was in the book, it is still subversive. Mm -hmm. It's still atypical for John Wayne. Yeah, totally. 2010. Do you think they cared about the source material? By source material, you mean the book. The book. 100%. 100%. Do you think they did a good job? They did an amazing job. Yes. So like further up into the corner, but still like we have two. What is it now? The left? Yeah. (laughs) We changed it. Upper left. So we have two upper left. That's pretty good. I think that is really good. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it too. This was a fun one. This is great. Well, this has been Adapter Parish. If you'd like to find us online, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at AdaptCast. And if you tweet about the show, don't forget to use the AdaptCast hashtag. You can join our groups on Facebook and Goodreads, and you can also find and follow me on Letterboxd. If you have anything to say that's longer than a tweet, you can always send an email to adapterparishcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support the show, there are two great ways you can do it. First, tell a friend. Second, a rating and review on your podcast platform of choice would be greatly appreciated. I'm just going to do the last line of the book. Yeah, I think that's great. This ends my true account of how I avenged Frank Ross's blood over in the Choctaw Nation when snow was on the ground. I reckon. She never says that. I reckon she does. Goodbye, everyone. I reckon she does not. Goodbye. (laughs) Goodbye.